It is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Carleton. To the acting uh, premier. Uh, today, the OPP claimed that they don't know exactly when 20 of the 24 computers were illegally accessed by Peter Face. How can you stand in this assembly and say definitively that no computers were accessed after February 11th, when the OPP stated today they could have been accessed up until March 20th? Can you tell me exactly what you know that the OPP doesn't? Thank you. <laughs> Acting Premier. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think members of the legislature are aware that uh, an officer with the Ontario Provincial Police appeared in front of uh, the Justice Committee this morning. And Mr. Speaker, he had two messages for that committee. The first is that the investigation is centered on the former Chief of Staff to uh, Premier McGuinty and that, in fact, it uh, had nothing to do with the, the current Premier. In fact, I invite members to go on the Globe and Mail website. They may enjoy uh, the headline of the article that's up about that appearance, and I quote, no evidence win oversaw document purge, OPP says. Wow. The second thing, Mr. Speaker, and this is just as important that the OPP conveyed to the committee, is that politicians should stay out of OPP investigations. Politicians have no business in OPP investigations, and that a politician getting involved in an OPP investigation yes, may, sir. in fact, put that investigation in jeopardy. And Mr. Speaker, I think the honourable member should follow the Thank advice you. of the Ontario Provincial Council. I would suggest that the honourable minister actually check the transcripts. I actually sat through committee, and here's what else he said. He said those computers could have been accessed up until March Minister 20th. Of he said that the premier's transition from Mr. McGinty to Ms. Wynne happened almost immediately. He said that people that were staffing the transition between Kathleen Wynne and Dalton McGinty happened almost on a daily basis. He also said he enjoyed appearing before our committee. So I'm going to ask you again, what could you possibly know about the access of these computers that the OPP doesn't know? How can you stand here in the legislature and say without a shadow of a doubt that no computers were wiped under the watch of the Gwynn administration? Are you now taking a book out of Laura Miller's page and calling the OPP liars? Um, I, uh, I know that uh, this is a, a, a certain time in our history where things get heated. I'm going to off, offer caution to all members. Um, there is uh, my concern about parliamentary language, and let's just make sure we don't go there. The uh, acting premier, Mr. Speaker, I'm I'm quite uh, happy to quote from uh, Officer Duval of the Ontario Provincial Police, who appeared in front of the committee. Let me give one exchange he had with the member from Toronto Danforth. Here is the quote. I can tell you that based on the information to obtain that I produced, it centered on the action of Mr. David Livingston only. I'd also like there to share is. with the uh, honourable members what the uh, officer had to say as well. I've been an officer for 17 years. It is an unusual request for a detective or an investigator to testify in the evidence that's been uncovered as we are doing. Uh, during this investigation is very unusual. But please understand that if you require me to answer questions on specific evidence, I could potentially threaten the prosecution on any criminal offences that may resolve from this investigation. There is a significant public interest in preserving the integrity Answer. of a criminal investigation. Order, please. I know, Mr. Speaker, that the honourable member likes staying up late watching Ellery Thank Green you. on television, but let's leave Thank this you. to the Ontario Provincial Police. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thanks. I actually have a Netflix program for the minister to watch, Orange is the New Black. I hope you look good in orange. Uh, but uh, I'd like to say this uh, to, to the minister. What also the OPP uh, detective constable said to the assembly is while David Livingston is right now the person of interest, they could potentially expand their search warrants as well as potential ITOs. That means you're not out of the clear yet, my friend. So I have a question for the acting premier. If you're so concerned. The uh, Minister of Education will come to order. The Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. And it's a little late, but the Minister from the Environment uh, will come to order. 
Why didn't the government launch an internal investigation into the destruction of documents or the alleged destruction of documents after the Information and Privacy Commissioner Ann Kavukian stated in her report in June 2013 that that had happened? Were you afraid of what the results might be because you knew Peter Fink was still on the payroll with the Liberal Party? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would, I would remind the member when the uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner report came out that we responded uh, almost immediately to all her non-legislative recommendations. Action was taken to put in place uh, uh, the proper regime for record keeping. And I would also point her to a piece of legislation which has been introduced in this legislature, which responds to some of the legislative recommendations of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. This Premier, Mr. Speaker. Simcoe North come to order. Wynne has uh, taken this, uh, her obligation very, very seriously, and we have seen significant activity over the past year to make sure that documents are properly maintained by this government. Thank you. New question. To the acting Premier, it's very minister, clear the that the Premier the did Carlton. not take her job seriously. She pretends she wasn't Premier of Ontario for six weeks between February and March of last year. I ask again, on March 19th, your Deputy uh, Director of Human Resources, Emily Marangoni advised the manager of information technology to remove the special administrative rights used by Peter Feist. How did Emily Margoni know to have this access removed on March 19th, and why did she do so on March 19th? Answer the question. Mr. Speaker, let's, let's go back to this morning. We had an officer of the Ontario Provincial Police appear in front of the committee. He himself admitted this is an extraordinary uh, situation in which he outlined two things. First of all, that the investigation involves Mr. David Livingston. There are allegations which are not proven. This is a very serious matter. And the term, the time in which uh, Premier McGuinty was in office. The second thing that he stressed, Mr. Speaker, is that it is not for members of parliament, it is not for elected politicians to try to play amateur detective here. Oh, Let us allow the Ontario Provincial Police to undertake their work. They will that reach whatever conclusions they reach, Mr. Speaker, and then we will be in a position to respond. Thank you. Supplementary. If the, uh, if the Acting Premier wants to talk about amateur hour. He should read the ITO reference to his government and their previous Premier and what bureaucrats said about their government. But anyway, I will go back to this. What we know is that the OPP could charge further individuals. We do know computers could have been accessed up until March 20th. We do know that the Premier's uh, transition team took place almost immediately, and it confirmed that when Kathleen Wynne won the leadership Order. on January 26th, she, she took uh, access of that office almost immediately. When was the first time that the Premier, the Minister of Government Services, who's also the House Leader, and the Deputy Premier met with David Livingston or any member of her transition team to discuss the deleted emails and the gas plant Question. scandal? Let us know, please. Thank you. Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you, Deputy uh, Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I will go to Officer Duval of the Ontario Provincial Police. Quote his words: "I can tell you that, based on the information to obtain that I produced, it centered, obviously, means the investigation." on the action of Mr. David Livingston only. Ah. And in fact, the member from Toronto, Danforth, goes on and says, have more warrants been executed than this? And the officer says, no. Oh. You know, Mr. Speaker, you're not getting anywhere across the way with this. Let me share again, let me remind members what uh, some of the media are saying about this dog and pony show. Globe and Mail, April 1st. The Conservative leaders' aggressive attempts to score points without the facts to back them up are reminding Ontario voters why they haven't warmed up to them. The Toronto Star, April Answer. 1st. The leader of the opposition went far beyond what the facts show. Toronto Star, April 1st. Every time the Thank leader you. of the I can go. No, you can't. <laughs> Final supplementary. Speaker, the, the reality here is that this is a government that is not telling the true story to the people of this province. They're not telling the whole story to the people of this province. It is very clear from the government's IT, from the OPP's ITO. We know, for example, these computers could have been accessed up until March 20th. We know that the transition took place very quickly between the two 
former Premier and the current Premier. We know, for example, that many members of that former Premier's staff are still working with this government, including in that minister's office. Now, let's talk about David Nicol. You threw him under the bus yesterday. When's Kathleen Wynne going to send you out of town, too? I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to uh, the uh, Minister of Energy. I'm uh, trying to address, uh, as I warned earlier, uh, this is getting desperately close. That was uh, too close for my comfort, and I'll ask the member to refrain and all members to refrain from making any references whatsoever uh, to truth telling. Carry on, Mr. Speaker. I. Uh I'm a very patient individual. I'll quote Officer Duval once again. In an exchange with the member from Toronto, Danforth, about the investigation, he said, and I quote, I can tell you that based on the information to obtain that I produced, it centered, meaning the investigation, on the action of Mr. David Livingston only. But let me go back to my quotes. And Mr. Speaker, I never thought I'd do this, but I'm going to quote Margaret Wente in this morning's Globe. What is Despite Margaret the Wente? rantings of the progressive conservative leader of the opposition, there's nothing so far to link the Premier to the gas plant Margaret scandal. Wente. Even my conservative friends think the leader of the opposition is bad news. He comes across as a small town That's bully. His political out. misjudgments just keep piling up. His attacks on the Premier over the gas plant yes, scandal are both shrill and unnecessary, Mr. Speaker. I think Margaret Wente speaks for herself. Thank you. Thank you. To the acting premier, does the Liberal government believe that Liberal operatives should be offering their full cooperation to the OPP's investigation into the gas plant scandal? Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I will go to uh, uh, the OPP officer, Mr. Duval, who appeared uh, in front of the committee. And I will uh, uh, provide a quote of what he said this morning. It is my understanding, however, that the OPP has received cooperation from senior government officials okay. in this matter. There has never been an issue. The government has provided full cooperation, Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms the of member uh, from the Hamilton committee East itself. Stony uh, Creek members are aware order. that the Premier has appeared several times. I've appeared in front of the committee, the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we are offering uh, the fullest cooperation to the Ontario Provincial Police as they undertake this uh, very important undertaking. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the fact is, this morning at committee, the OPP confirmed that Liberal operatives, including one who worked for the Ontario Liberal Party up until this very weekend, Speaker, declined to provide a statement to the OPP. Does the acting premier think that that's acceptable? Wow. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would uh, urge anyone that the OPP uh, approaches to be fully cooperative. As I said, on this side of the legislature, when it comes to uh, uh, anyone who is uh, involved with uh, or works for our government, uh, we have been fully cooperative. The OPP confirmed that this morning. I think there have been other references that were made uh, in front of the committee about the cooperation uh, with this government. We certainly take this matter uh, seriously, Mr. Speaker, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I provide the same caution to the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker, that what we learned this morning from the Ontario Provincial Police is it's best for politicians not to involve themselves in an investigation and to allow the OPP to reach conclusions Thanks, independently and answer. not jeopardize the proceedings. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, can the acting premier tell us why key liberal operatives, liberals that he and his team worked with for many years and through many campaigns, may have refused to talk to police? Does he know why they would have wanted to refuse to talk to police? Speaker? Mr. Speaker, again, all I can do is quote the officer, and I, I apologize to the officer, the inspector. I should have used his proper title. Exactly. Inspector Andre Duval with the OPP, who said, It is my understanding, however, that the OPP has received cooperation from senior government officials in this matter. The is. OPP uh, have clearly stated at the committee this morning and also in the documents before the court that uh, uh, in this case the accusations are against one person. They are unfounded accusations. Mr. David Livingston, the, uh, the former uh, chief of 
staff to the former Premier, Mr. Speaker, and the OPP uh, obviously has freedom to ask or question any individual. And of course, Answer. I would encourage everyone to cooperate fully with them. And speaking on behalf of the government, I can say that our government is cooperating, as was outlined by Inspector Duval this morning. Question, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Acting Premier. We learned today that the government's own cybersecurity unit was conducting an active internal investigation of the wiping of data in the Premier's office. Was the Premier's office aware of this, Speaker? Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, again, there uh, is an active OPP investigation going on. It involves, as has been outlined in the uh, documents that were produced on Thursday uh, in the court, it involves the actions of the former Chief of Staff to the former Premier, uh, Mr. David Livingston. Uh, they are serious allegations. Everyone acknowledges that. They are unproven. And, Mr. Speaker, what we learned at committee this morning are two things. First of all, that they involve that period of time when Premier McGuinty was Premier, not the current Premier. And the second Second is that we should not be conducting police investigations here on the floor of the legislature. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, that's why they should have called a public inquiry a year ago, Speaker. That's right. Uh, the Premier has indicated that she was in the dark about key details of computers being wiped in the Minister Premier's Community office Social until, Services newspaper, come to order. until newspaper reports emerge, Speaker. Now, how is that possible if the government's own cyber security unit was investigating? Wow. Mr. Speaker, again, last Thursday there were some documents made public about an investigation that was being undertaken by the Ontario Provincial Police. That document spoke from about Bruce one Gray individual come to who there are accusations about, and that was confirmed in front of the committee this morning. What it said, Mr. Speaker, was that uh, they were pursuing these accusations, potential wrongdoing in the, in the course of uh, Mr. David Livingston, the former Chief of Staff to the former Premier. What we heard this morning, Mr. Speaker, was a confirmation of that. It did not involve the uh, current Premier, who has answered numerous questions here in the legislature and to the media. And the other uh, uh, piece of advice, Mr. Speaker, is that politicians should keep their noses out of this and Answer. we shouldn't be having a police investigation here on the floor of the legislature. Thank you. Final supplementary. Gee, Speaker, I hope the Liberals have learned a lot more than that from what's going on with the gas <laughs> <plant. laughs> Speaker, the Liberal government keeps insisting that they'll be open and accountable, that they are open and accountable, that they'll be sharing all information. But what people see are key Liberal operatives refusing to respond to OPP requests for interviews, a Premier who's frantically firing people and acting shocked when the public hears details of multiple investigations going on under her nose and in her office. Now, is this the brand of Liberal accountability that the people of Ontario expect? Is this good enough for the people of Ontario? Speaker? No, Mr. Speaker. What they are seeing is, is uh, theatrics on the part of the opposition who are trying to position themselves as police officers. This is a very serious matter, Mr. Speaker, and the fact of the matter is there is a tradition in this uh, province that when the police are undertaking their work, politicians get out of their way. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I have some quotes for the NDP as well. Let me quote the Toronto Star, March 30th. The leader of the NDP involved, indulged in conventional opposition mischief by implying police were now focusing on questions about the period after the premier was sworn in and became Premier, a clear misreading of the OPP documents. The Globe and Mail, March 31st, there is nothing in the documents that su suggest any records were deleted after Ms. Wynne was sworn into office on February 11, 2013, yes, Mr. Speaker. Let's let these third parties uh, speak for themselves in the analysis of the mischief that is going Thank on you. from the opposition. New question. Member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Parrot Pan American Games. Another minister, scandal. you've commissioned a shipyard in Belfast, Maine, to custom build you a 45-foot limousine boat for the games. Oh, Let me remind you, limousine boating is not a Pan Am sport. Neither is exotic liberal spending. And since there's no limo boat line item in the Pan Am budget, can you please tell the taxpayers, minister, how much will this ship cost? The SS McGuinty. Minister responsible for the Pan Parrot Pan American Games. Speaker. Another question? And, uh, another order? Of the uh, Pen and Parapen American game. Speaker, what the member opposite doing 
He wants to tear down the Hamilton Stadium. He wants to tear down the Milton Velodrome. He wants to tear down the Aquatic Center. He wants to tear down the wouldn't want you as village, the captain of the, the ship. Athletic the member opposite speaker, they want to run down our athletes right. who train their whole life to compete in this game. Speaker, they want to run down the coaches who prepare our great athletes. They want to run down our game players and everything they work so hard for. Speaker, they want to tear down our relationship Answer. with Passover Nation. Speaker, they want to tear down the spirit of the game. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. What a bunch of baloney. Minister, if there's anyone responsible for tearing down and destroying the spirit of the Pan Am Games, it's you. Yeah. Out of control. Out of control. Minister, hiding spending doesn't reduce spending. You've awarded yet another foreign contract to Trefoil Marine to build your lavish limo boat plus three water taxis. Clearly, you don't know anything about this, so let me fill you in. Big this company is renowned for tech savvy and high cost. Even the company president has said that the people look at the price and say, they must be out of their mind. But, that but that's the price they go for. And just because you want to be cool in front of your dignitary friends, it doesn't mean you can help yourself to unlimited taxpayer funds. Right. Minister, I'm going to ask you again. How much money is your limo boat costing to build, transport here, just get and operate? Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. That'll do. <laughs> Speaker, we are working very hard to build a Pan Am game. As according to the President of PASO, the international body for Pan Am, the President said, Ontario will host the best ever Pan and Para Pan America in Ontario. Speaker, look at our standing speaker. So far, the capital project is all on time, on budget or under budget. And recently, Speaker, we, we, we forecast the budget down 49 million. That's Answer. standing speaker. And recently, again, Speaker, we roll out the transportation framework, we roll out the security framework. Speaker, we are building Thank you. the best ever game. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. When Peter Feist was allegedly in the Premier's office deleting emails, he had a contract with the Liberal Party and the Liberal Caucus. Can the Acting Premier tell Ontarians who was paying Peter Feist for his work at that time? Was it the Liberal Party or the Caucus? Acting Premier. The same, Mr. Speaker. I'm a very, very patient individual. Um, we have commented uh, before on Peter Feist and uh, his uh, work that he did for the Liberal Caucus uh, under the former Premier and the work that he did under the Ontario Liberal Party. The Honourable Member is standing up here today and asking what I believe are detailed questions related to an ongoing police investigation. And I'm quite shocked, Mr. Speaker, considering the fact that he was in committee this morning and would have heard Inspector Duval give a very clear warning to members of the legislature of the fact is that you respect a police investigation. You do not conduct a police investigation on the floor of the legislature. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, he may himself be jeopardizing the police investigation by engaging in this type of behavior in the legislature. It really is beneath that honourable member. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I believe these are straightforward questions, and I expect a straightforward answer from the acting premier. Yeah. OPP documents allege Peter Feist came into the premier's office and wiped out computers, and was under contract to the Liberal Party and Caucus. Will the government provide Peter Feist invoices for his work that day and any other work wiping out government computers? Good question. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have uh, uh, spoken in the House about Peter Feist's involvement, both with the Liberal Caucus Service Bureau 
and the Ontario uh, Liberal Party, the first under the former Premier and the second up until uh, last Sunday. We have offered this information to the proper authorities. Mr. Speaker, I wish to make clear we'll let the police reach whatever conclusions they want. We have no indication that the invoices or any of the work done are in any way related to the allegations about the former Chief of Staff in the former Premier's office. But again, Mr. Speaker, I warn the Honourable Member, as Inspector Duval said this morning, and I quote, if you require me to answer questions on specific evidence, I could potentially threaten the prosecution on any criminal offences that may resolve from this investigation. I think, Mr. Speaker, all yes, members sir. should take the advice of Inspector Duval to heart. Sure, sure. Thank you. A new question. The member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Uh, Speaker, last year the government announced a number of changes to social assistance across the province. These changes were a first step in a plan to reform Ontario's social assistance programs with the objective of removing barriers and increasing opportunities for everyone to participate in the workforce. And since the start of the process to reform social services in the province, many of my constituents, uh, Speaker, and Glengarry Prescott Russell would like to know what changes they can expect. Some constitu constituents have mentioned that there might be a merger of Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Program. Speaker, through you, can the minister clarify if this merger is in our government's plans, and could he let us know of the good work being done to reform social assistance in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Community and Social Services. Oh, thanks, Mr. Speaker, and I'm delighted to respond to the honourable member's question. Uh, and I want to speak a bit about our future plans for social assistance reform. In particular, I get a lot of questions about the merger of OW and ODSP, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, our government is committed to making social assistance work better for our clients. Our plan is guided by the advice we received from Blank and Shake report and by the conversations we're having with clients, advocates, and other partners. Speakers, let me be very clear about something. Our government has considered the recommendation that both programs be merged, but we believe keeping them intact is the best way forward. For this reason, we will not, I repeat, not be merging the two programs. We've heard loud and clear from virtually everybody yes, that this isn't the way to go, so we're looking forward to improving the programs as they exist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. There's always an interest in the way social assistance programs are delivered across this great province, and providing services in an effective manner is important. Ontarians expect services that are easy to access and are responsive to their needs. However, Speaker, it's absolutely crucial that social assistance recipients understand that reform is necessary at times to ensure that the system works better for the long term. Speaker, it's very quiet in here. Speaker, the minister indicated that Ontario works and the Ontario Disability Support Program will not be merged. It was. Please finish. Speaker the, me. Speaker, the minister indicated that Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support yeah. Program will not be merged. Yeah. Could he please tell us if there are still ways we can improve Question. how these programs operate or if recipients should expect the status quo? Yes. Thank you. Minister. The Speaker needs help, but not necessarily that kind. Mr. Speaker, uh, absolutely not. Uh, it means instead of spending time on merging programs, we're focusing on making both programs work better at supporting people and removing barriers to employment. Our multi-year reform plan has four objectives. To motivate and support people to be successful in the workforce, to provide, Mr. Speaker, more adequate assistance, to deliver modern, responsive services, from Dufferin, Calvin, and, and ensure order. public confidence in the system. Yeah, yeah. We are making progress on harmonizing the rules and benefits. We are making practical improvements to benefit clients, like testing peer mentors to help clients achieve their employment goals indeed. Minister, we have come a long way. Social assistance affects almost 900,000 people every day. Reform is taking time. We're doing it right by consulting Thank with the people. Thanks very much. Your question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, my question is the Minister of Transportation. 
Last November, the members of this House unanimously passed my private member's resolution to set up an all-party committee to study transportation needs in rural and northern Ontario. We are now into the spring session and over four months of no action from your government. Whoa. Minister, will you agree to honour the wish of this House so this committee can be set up? Stop the clock. Oh, okay. I'll take it. <laughs> Please. Oh, I guess I can. You cannot. The Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. What was the question? <laughs> the government has to speak. The Acting Premier. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I mean, it's interesting. The fact of the matter is that the honourable member is, is, is talking about a, a process question. The, the fact is that our government has very, been very proud of its record of activity when it comes to northern Ontario, when it comes to rural areas, when it comes you to the subject the areas that, uh, that he puts forward, Mr. Speaker. I don't think we necessarily need another committee, Mr. Speaker, in order to take the type of action which I know that the Minister of Transportation has taken and is going to take over the coming months as we deal with these transportation issues. Through throughout uh, these areas throughout the province, Mr. Speaker. We don't need another committee. Thank you. Supplementary. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, that's the typical answer that we do get when we talk about rural Ontario. Right. Yep. Again, back to the Minister of Transportation, and hopefully he'll pay more attention and give me a good answer this time. Minister, you know that presently in rural and northern Ontario, public transportation is essentially non-existent. You have heard through me and through rural and northern residents, as well as anti-poverty groups, including the United Way, of how critical it is we action this transportation study. Following the cutbacks by Via Rail and Greyhound bus services and your government's divestiture of Ontario Northland, as many as 2 million people in some 390 communities north of the GTA today can't readily access transportation to get to work, to doctor's appointments, or to visit family and friends. Again, Minister, will you do the right thing? We have set up this all-party committee immediately. Transportation infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I, I just want to try and get my head around uh, what the member is trying to suggest here, because when, when his party was in power, uh, the last, the, the last, the last few years they were in power, Mr. Speaker, um, they spent 1.4 billion dollars on infrastructure, which was an all-time low. T today we're spending 14 billion dollars a year on infrastructure. We are spending. Ten dollars in rural Ontario for infrastructure for every one dollar the Conservatives spent. So this party that's supposed to be pro-rural spent ten cents for every dollar we spend in rural rural infrastructure. And the reason the reason that the honourable member has so many problems is because his party in power does what his Answer. federal party continues to do: cancel via cut back service, cancel projects, and that's why we have a problem. We don't need a committee. We need to keep spending Thank the way you. we are and investing in rural Ontario. Thank you. New question: The member from Bramley, Gorham, Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. The Liberal government has denied knowing anything about the police investigation, but today, in Justice Committee, with our witness, Detective Constable Duval from the Anti-Rackets branch of the OPP, indicated that the OPP was interviewing current political staff in this building and during business hours. How is it possible that the government had no inkling of what was happening while police were roaming the halls and interviewing and conducting interviews with these people. Thank you. Dr. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, you know, again, I, I suggest that after question period, the honourable member may want to go to the Globe and Mail website and read the headline of their coverage of what Inspector Duval said today and the conclusion they reached that, in fact, none of this activity occurred under the current Premier. He may also want to take a lesson from Inspector Duval when he warned legislators that their job is not to interfere in police investigations. It may, even, it may even hamper it. And you know, Mr. Speaker, what's interesting is that uh, uh, the member from Vaughan from Vaughan uh, asked, asked a number of questions Order. of the inspector. The first set of questions, Mr. Speaker, involved the allegations, the, the, the scurrilous allegations that have been made by the Leader of the Opposition. If they were true or supported by the ITO, Inspector Duval gave a very simple answer, no. Answer. Then the member from Don said, I notice, or Vaughan, excuse me, I notice in reviewing the ITO and looking at the list of names that, in Thank fact, you. even members— Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you very much. I trust the discretion of Detective Constable Duval in answering the questions that he thought were appropriate. And uh, I asked the acting premier to answer this next question. There were OPP investigators at Queen's Park over the course of weeks. There were around a half a dozen visits and at least 14 interviews conducted in this building. But Minister somehow the government claims that they knew nothing about this investigation, nothing about this until last week. Does the acting premier understand why Ontarians would have a difficult time understanding this or accepting this? Thank you. Acting premier. Mr. Speaker, I think it has been a matter of public record that the OPP have been investigating for some time. What happened last Thursday, Mr. Speaker, is some documents were made public by the court. In them were some accusations, very serious accusations, against the former chief of staff to the former premier. And at that time, the premier indicated that that's the first that she had learned of them. I think for most Ontarians, it was the first that she, she had learned of them. But again, Mr. Speaker, let me go back to the exchange with Inspector uh, Duval and the member from Don. So to be clear, if an individual's name is listed in this ITO, does that necessarily mean they have committed a crime or they have actually engaged in any wrongdoing? No. Then he said, the member from Vaughan, I noticed in reviewing the ITO and looking at the list of names that, in fact, even members of the PC caucus and the NDP caucus are listed in the ITO. Oh. Just out of curiosity, why are the names in the ITO? And he answered the inspector, Answer. some of them were witnesses for this police investigation. Wow. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, the police have undertaken their work, Thank and you. as Inspector Duval cautioned, we should allow them Thank to you. continue that work. See the please, new question, the member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le ministre du Développement économique. Du... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for uh, the Minister of uh, Economic Development and Employment. This question concerns our government's commitment to become North America's leading jurisdiction for social enterprises, to encourage businesses to have a positive social, cultural, and environmental impact, while, of course, generating revenue. That's our positive plan to create jobs and grow our economy. In September, Ontario launched its social enterprise strategy, strategy, a comprehensive plan to grow the sector, which already represents 10,000 social enterprises across the province, 68% of which have a focus on poverty reduction. We're creating the conditions for businesses to thrive in a socially conscious way, especially important in my own riding of Etobicoke North. Question. Speaker, my question is this. Can the minister please inform the House about our accomplishments in social enterprise? The Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, social enterprises, as the member just said, are businesses and not-for-profits that have positive social, environmental, and cultural impact. And Ontario is already a leading jurisdiction in uh, social enterprise. But our goal, Mr. Speaker, is to make Ontario the number one jurisdiction in North America for social enterprise. And to do that, we've created the Office for Social Enterprise in my ministry to support this initiative. And as part of our strategy, the government has launched a four million dollar social Social Enterprise Demonstration Fund that builds the capacity of our early stage high growth social enterprises. We also are working to connect social enterprises with global investors. It will be a $1 trillion market globally within the decade, Mr. Speaker. We want our social enterprises to be able to tap into that market. So we've partnered with social capital markets, with Mars and Answer. the Royal Bank of Canada to host an international social finance con conference just last month here in Toronto, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, Minister, speaking doctor to doctor, I appreciate your uh, overview. I know my own community of Etobicoke North would be pleased to hear that our government has been active in connecting investors and social entrepreneurs, especially since many social enterprises hire youth and other vulnerable communities. In my own riding, like many members in this House, having a large youth population, have, will, having, uh, will have, uh, therefore I have many conversations with constituents about the strides that we're making for their jobs and social enterprise strategies. I believe, Speaker, it's important that we've taken the initiative to establish an office to coordinate social enterprise activities across government. This, of course, will streamline the process. Speaker, my question is this. What are the other supports that we have developed to help the social enterprise sector develop and thrive in this globalized economy? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we've also supported the establishment and launch of the Social Venture Connection, a, an exchange, which is the first in North America social finance. It's the first in North America social finance platform that connects impact investors with investment-ready social 
enterprises. We've also announced we're moving forward with social impact bonds. But, Mr. Speaker, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to acknowledge again Tim Jones, who's the CEO of Artscape, a great social enterprise here in Toronto that strengthens arts and culture. Tim was recently awarded a very prestigious international honour from the Schwab Foundation and has been named Social Entrepreneur of the Year. So congratulations, Tim. He's just an example of one of the many talented social entrepreneurs and social enterprises here in this province that we are working hard to support. Thank you. Senator, please. Thank you. New question. Member from Chatham, Kent Essex. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. My my question is to the uh, Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, with cottage leases set to expire at the end of 2017, the Rondo Cottagers Association has fought to keep the 120-year-old community intact. You have been cooperative, as have previous MNR ministers. The cottagers were relieved when you told them that there was no appetite to throw them out. However, a letter to the cottagers dated March 25th from Assistant Deputy Minister Tracy Mill stated that it is the park's goal to, and I quote, restore and rehabilitate the park to its natural state. This will continue to be the goal of the ministry for years ahead, unquote. Cottagers are rightly concerned, Minister, that her statement means the cottages question? are doomed for demolition. Right These are mixed messages. Minister, my question is, is the removal of the cottages within Rondo you. imminent? And if so, will you, you make the final call for your bureaucrats? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the question uh, from the member opposite. The member opposite uh, knows full well uh, we've been working together on this staff uh, from my office Minister senior of the staff, environment met with him february 12th uh, of this year to discuss this uh, issue i don't believe the uh, messages are uh, incompatible in the sense that we're doing everything we can to ensure that the uh, ecological integrity of the park is maintained as the member opposite knows there's a high a number of endangered species uh, in this park uh, area. Uh, this is the last area of uh, Carolinian forest uh, in the province uh, that's contained within this park. And there are 285 cottage uh, leases in this park as well that have been extended uh, over 21-year uh, periods of time uh, for, a number of, uh, for a number of years. So we need to get this right. As the uh, member knows, we're committed to working with him and the cottagers to find Answer. a solution moving forward. Yep. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The 420-foot uh, dock at Rondo Provincial Park was extensively damaged by ice over this harsh winter. A local petition to save it has gathered over a thousand signatures online, and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters have added their support for the repair of the pier. The Rondo Cottage Association has even—they're open to negotiations to even help pay for the repairs. Now, this pier was used for swimming fishing, walking, and even enjoyed by many residents in my community and tourists for decades. The Big Dock, as it's called, is unique to Rondo and a main attraction. Respectfully, Minister, in the words of the anglers in my riding, are we going to fish or continue to cut bait? Can you say today that the historical structure will not be removed from the park and repaired this year? Question. Thank you. Mr. Thanks, uh, Speaker, and again, thanks to the member for the question. Uh, you know, one of the challenges uh, with respect to this park, as the member knows full well, is that uh, cottagers in the park uh, have benefited from the payment in lieu by the ministry, which has uh, totaled almost $900,000 a year in taxes being paid to the community of Chatham Kent uh, in lieu of taxes that probably should have been paid by cottagers, as the member uh, knows. The ministry is under incredible pressure with respect to these types of infrastructure investments. We have these types of needs all across the province, and we want to prioritize and use our resources as best possible to uh, remediate and improve these types of uh, uh, infrastructure projects. So, Again, we're committed to working with the member and uh, look forward to uh, a solution moving forward. As the member also knows, there were environmental and economic studies that were uh, supposed to be done. They are nearing completion. We should Answer. be able to release those in the next several weeks, and we'll have more to say about that. So I look forward to working with the member. Thank you. Your question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Acting Premier. Does the Acting Premier think the people of Ontario should be paying for partisan ads that promote the governing party instead of the public interest? 
Absolutely not, Mr. Speaker, which is why when we came to power, we were so offended. One of the first things we did, Mr. Speaker, was undo the practice of the former Progressive Conservative Party, which used taxpayers' money. I remember as an Ontarian being disgusted with the countless flyers that I was receiving in my mailbox of a partisan nature, which Mr. Speaker had uh, uh, were put forward by the government, paid for with taxpayers' money, but were in fact promoting the Progressive Conservative Party. That's why when we came to power, Mr. Speaker, we passed legislation in 2004, I believe it was, to make sure that in those three key areas, radio and TV, Newspapers and billboards that, Mr. Speaker, those I ads will be looked at by the can't heckle if you're not to make sure seat. that they serve the appropriate uh, the appropriate uh, purpose that they were being put out for, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, to the acting premier, that legislation has got loopholes so big you can drive a train through the darn things. So I ask you again. We know in the last three months you spent $30 million in partisan ads put forward by the government and by the broader public sector, and you continue doing it. I'm going to ask you the question once again. Are you prepared to close those loopholes in order to stop the people and stop those agencies from spending money that could, quite frankly, be used for better things? Mr. Speaker, I think we have to be careful here. We brought in a new regime when it comes to advertising, Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, disgusted with what had gone on under the previous government. We expect uh, all taxpayer-funded advertising to apply to that regime or to adhere to that regime, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, we ask the Auditor General to focus on those three key areas, Mr. Speaker, radio and TV, uh, newspapers and billboards, Mr. Speaker, and ensure, provide that double check, that double peace of mind that, in fact, that these ads are appropriate. Mr. Speaker, there is nothing wrong with government advertising. Mr. Speaker, they uh, talk about valuable government services, Mr. Speaker, but the fact of the matter is we have brought in a regime that I am very proud of, particularly in the face of what we saw in the province of Ontario for eight very long years. No question, member from Scarborough, Gildwood. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. According to the 2011 census, almost a quarter of First Nations people in Canada live in Ontario, more than in any other province. 80% of the Aboriginal population in Ontario lives off-reserve, with 62% residing in urban centres. My riding of scarborough Guildwood has one of the highest off-reserve Aboriginal populations in the province. The population is young and growing, with 36% comprised of youth aged 19 and under, compared with 25% for non-Aboriginal, and a growth rate, a historic growth rate, of 32%. I know Aboriginal people living in urban areas face unique challenges, like higher unemployment rates, lower health status, and a lower rate of high school graduation than non-Aboriginal. Approximately 37,000 Aboriginal people are living in Question. Toronto alone, with large populations in Ottawa, Sudbury and Thunder Bay. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us how government is working to improve and deliver services to Aboriginal people living thank you. in urban centres? Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, on Monday, just this past Monday, I was pleased to announce, along with the Minister of Infrastructure and the Minister of Health and Culture, uh, that the province is transferring a section of land on the site of the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games Athletes Village to the Anishinaabe Health Centre in Toronto. Here, a world-class health care and dynamic Aboriginal community and cultural centre will be built following the Games. And I'm very excited to share that my ministry and I will be taking on the responsibility of acting as the lead facilitator in this important initiative. We will work directly with Anishinaabe Health to bring together appropriate Aboriginal partners so the hub meets the diverse needs of the Aboriginal people. This hub will serve as a place for learning and innovation, for sharing traditional and modern culture and knowledge. Answer. And it and it can provide a variety of services. Mr. Speaker, we are working for a space where the Aboriginal community can Thank gather you. in this great city. The Aboriginal community. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It's great to hear such good news. 
This really points to the whole government approach Ontario is taking to support the Aboriginal community. Projects like this are the building blocks to a relationship built on trust and mutual respect with urban Aboriginal peoples in Ontario. We know that a constructive, cooperative relationship with Aboriginal peoples in Ontario leads to improved opportunities and a better future, not only for Aboriginal people, but for all people living in Ontario. Given the landmark nature of this announcement, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can the Minister expand upon the land to be transferred? When will the Community Health Centre and Aboriginal Hub be built? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, to the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. of Infrastructure Transportation. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank my friend from, from Scarborough, Guildwood, who I know shares a great passion for the uh, culture of Indigenous people. We're very excited about this, Mr. Speaker. This is 2.4 acres of land. Uh, it will be transferred. It has been legally transferred. It's in the ownership now of the uh, Ashinaabe Health uh, Foundation, who are working through the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs uh, with other urban Aboriginal groups and partners to to uh, see the development of this site as a legacy project, Mr. Speaker, after the Pan Am Games, so construction will start. What's going on right now is Douglas Cardinal is the architect that they've selected for the project, and the planning will be going ahead for a comprehensive cultural, performing, visual arts, uh, employment, uh, entrepreneurship, as well as wellness and, and the practice of traditional medicine. Mr. Answer. Speaker, we think this will be transformative to the future of Aboriginal people. I want to thank the Minister of Health, the Minister of Heritage and Culture, and my colleague the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs Thank for you. the leadership on this, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds, Brenda. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, it's your job to ensure law and order is maintained in Ontario. But you're failing to do that when it comes to cracking down on contraband tobacco. Yes, you are. Promises like increased fines are meaningless if you don't give the OPP and municipal police forces the authority and resources to stop illegal cigarettes from reaching the streets. As you stand idly by, hundreds of millions in tax revenue go up in smoke, and the livelihood of about 75,000 Ontarians in the convenience store sector are threatened. Can you tell me exactly what enforcement tools and resources you've given police to butt out illegal contraband? Thank you very much, Speaker, and I, I, I thank the member opposite for, uh, as, as the critic uh, to my ministry, for asking a very important question. I also, uh, Speaker, uh, uh, very much look forward to working uh, with both the critics, the member from Leeds Granville and the, the member from uh, London West, on important issues around uh, community safety. The speaker, uh, Speaker, these are these are very important issues, and and obviously I I am getting. Uh, briefed on them one by one to have a better understanding of as to how we ensure that on issues like contraband, uh, contraband uh, tobacco that we are as effective working in partnership with other police services, working in partnership with the RCMP uh, so that uh, we curtail uh, the, the, the imports of contraband and the use of contraband and, and uh, tobacco in our province. And I look forward to the yes, ideas uh, from the member opposite in that regard. Because I think, Speaker, frankly speaking, it's a shared responsibility for all of us. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the minister. Almost every speaker on Monday, when we debated your Bill 131, mentioned the government's lacking on the illegal tobacco trade. Uh, and you look at the, the issues in the province, you've essentially done nothing. And the Ontar latest Ontario Convenience Store Association's uh, study shows that I'm right. Your failure to give police the tools they need means illegal cigarettes now comprise nearly half of the market in some locations. More than 70 municipalities have passed resolutions asking you to get illegal smokes off their streets. Jurisdictions like Quebec prove that if police have the power to enforce, revenue goes up and the supply of contraband tobacco goes down. But it starts with you doing your job and putting hard-working Ontarians ahead of criminals. When are you going to do your job? When are you going to crack down on illegal cigarettes? Please. Can you see him, please? Thank you, Minister. 
Uh, speaker, uh, Speaker, I have full confidence, and the government has full confidence in the job of the OPP and other local police services do when it comes to cracking down on, on illegal tobacco. Speaker, there is a very robust relationship between the OPP, the RCMP, and other police services from other provinces and other mun and municipal services in making sure that uh, we're taking concrete steps in in uh, illegal activities around contraband tobacco. And, uh, Speaker, if you if you look at the results since 2008, for example. More more than 223 million illegal cigarettes, 2.5 million untaxed cigars, and 74 million grams of untaxed fine cut or other tobacco products have been seized by the Ministry of Finance investigators and inspectors. Uh, speaker, there is a lot of work that is already being done among police services on a very uh, a, a complicated scheme, uh, in fact, that is employed. Uh, and, and we have full confidence on our, on our police, on the RCMP, and other municipal services. They'll they continue to do the work. Thank and you. Legal tobacco is controlled in our province. Thank you. Question, the member from uh, Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing. Last summer, the previous uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs promised to reform the Ontario Municipal Board. But the government's review says, and I quote, this consultation will not discuss or consider eliminating or changing the OMB's operations practices and procedures, wow. end of quote. The government is bowing to developers who do not want any changes to the OMB. It's another bait and switch. People are tired of hearing this government promise one thing to communities and then deliver something else on behalf of developers. Will the new minister do what his government has promised and review the OMB itself? The, uh Minister, without portfolio, please come to order. And the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, I do understand very clearly that this particular member has expressed a uh, specific interest in this issue for quite a period of time. What I can tell him uh, is that there has been a significant consultation that has been undertaken on a specific issue. Uh, if I remember correctly, the consultation began. Uh, in the fall of last year oh, and concluded sorry, in, the, uh, in the early winter of this year, somewhere around January of 2014. That uh, consultation has completed. The detail is within the ministry. Uh, within a shorter period of time, I would hope I've asked uh, ministry staff for information back on this piece. They have the consultation. They're reviewing the materials. And at some point, I would hope in the not-too-distant future, they will get back to me with what they believe the next steps will be when it comes to this particular issue. We are so, uh, somewhat in the ministry still uncertain as to what the minister or the members of PMB would accomplish. And so we're taking this all into consideration. And hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, we'll have uh, something more to bring. Good but very so and the changes that, uh, that you're planning mean nothing without changes to the OMB itself. Absolutely. The OMB will still decide whether an appeal goes forward or not. Last year in Waterloo Region, the OMB ignored the province's places to grow at and approved a sprawling development ten times bigger than what the rules allowed. The OMB does not respect official plans or even provincial statutes. When will the government keep its promise and rein in the unelected and unaccountable and out of control OMB? Speaker, thank you very, very much. I go back to the original point I was trying to make. The member opposite is putting forward a position. In fact, I think it was in the media not too long ago. Was it Kitchener Waterloo region where he was, where he was speaking to them about his desire to see the OMB completely dissolved? Yeah. At the same time, when he was in Kitchener Waterloo, he suggested to them that we should do away with the OMB, but at the same time, we need to create some other mechanism to deal with these issues. Well, we already have a mechanism. You disagree on what the mechanism uh, is and whether it should still continue to exist, but at the same time, you seem to be suggesting we need something. Yeah. Well, Speaker, what we're doing as part of that consultation, that land use planning uh, consultation that was done across the province is considering potentially changes to the OMB as it is currently constructed. We'll have information coming back on that in the not too distant future. There is a provincial interest here to be maintained. We believe Answer. in that position, and very soon, hopefully very soon, I don't want to put a timeline on this, we'll be in a position to discuss this at a greater Thank you. Thank you. Questions? The member from Scarborough Region Court. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Speaker, six individuals from my riding of Scarborough Agent Court will be receiving an Ontario's Volunteer Service Award for 25 years of service to a non-profit organization. One of these volunteers, Warren Kedagaranam, is receiving this award for his outstanding work with the International Movement for Tamil Culture. Speaker, volunteers who donate the time, energy, skills and knowledge to cause close to the heart are true leaders and heroes in our community. Ontario has a long and proud tradition of volunteerism. It is estimated that Ontarians volunteer over 860 860 million volunteer hours annually. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please inform the House how our province recognizes these valuable Question. individuals to the Ontario Volunteer Service Awards? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court for the question, and I look forward to joining her on April 16th at her Volunteer Service Awards in Scarborough. This year, over 11,000 volunteers will be presented with the Ontario Volunteer Service Award. 55 ceremonies will be held across this great province from now until the end of June. And I'd like to remind and uh, personally invite all members of this House to please join their local communities as we celebrate the recipients and handing out the awards for the, uh, across this great province. Mr. Speaker, our province is the number one destination for newcomers. When newcomers choose our province, it's because they know how highly we place a value on fairness, equality, and social justice. They know that Ontario fundamentally believes in offering a hand to someone in need. They know that we take care of our neighbours and our communities, and we take care of our yes, vulnerable sir. population. Each year, six million volunteers across the province help make their communities a better place to live. The Volunteer Service Award is a unique platform to acknowledge the Thank hard you. work of local volunteers. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to join the ministers and congratulate all the 2014 award recipients. Speaker, I know that our government supports a number of initiatives to help to encourage and promote volunteerism in Ontario. Speaker, we also know that promoting and acknowledging volunteerism is a part of our government's plan to invest in the people and organizations that enrich our communities. And I want to share one example, Mr. Speaker. For almost nine years, I see on a weekly basis, young people in my riding of Scarborough Asian Corp volunteer in a reading program to young children. So I want to pay tribute to these young people, as well as volunteer in local nursing home and seniors facility. Speakers, through you to the minister, can he please update the House on other Ontario honours and recognition programs? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member for her question. And that is correct. Our province has several programs to acknowledge the dedication of our six million volunteers here in Ontario. In fact, I'm happy that the member has brought up a youth initiative in her local community. And I'd like to remind the members that this spring we'll be kicking off the seventh annual Change the World Youth Challenge. This year's campaign has been expanded to six weeks. The official goal is 30, 33,000 young people aged 14 to 18 and they will volunteer for at least three hours. Additionally, this spring, one of my favourite Ontario awards will be presented, the June Callwood Outstanding Achievement Award of Volunteerism. The late June Callwood committed her life to action and social justice, particularly those related to vulnerable communities. In her lifetime, she founded or co-founded more than 50 different organizations. Mr. Speaker, all of the award ceremonies mentioned today not only honour individuals, but they remind us of the value of being an active and engaged citizen here in the beautiful province of Thank Ontario. You. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, I look for some guidance from you on a very, very important, a very important point of order. It has come to my attention, Mr. Speaker, that it is your birthday this weekend, and I'm wondering if I could seek unanimous consent on behalf of the legislature to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> That's not a <laughs> I thought uh, I thought I was going to get past this one from the member from uh, the member from Durham would appreciate this very much. I don't want anybody to know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I uh, I appreciate it. Uh, 
member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke on a point of order. That we won't be sitting tomorrow. I would like to wish my colleague Jim Wilson a happy birthday tomorrow, and also my brothers Mark and Martin tomorrow as well. They, they, they say there's something special about April. Anyway, there are there being no deferred votes. This house stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.